Okay, I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about <clears throat> um, judgment in a specific sense. So I want to start by explaining what that sense uh, of the term is that um, will be the subject of the talk. <clears throat> uh, the term judgment is often used in a normative context, as in moral judgment, or um, as per my little joke, uh, judgment day in certain religions or uh, a judge's ruling in a, in a trial. <clears throat> but we're going to be talking about a wider concept, a broader concept. The concept that we invoke when, some, when we say someone has good judgment, or when we say that some decision is a judgment call. Not necessarily normative, uh, and it's that wider concept that um, I'm interested in, um, and primarily in the epistemology of it. <clears throat> Webster's, uh, Amer American Heritage and Webster's, here are a couple of definitions. The capacity to assess situations or circumstances and draw sound conclusions. Good sense. Or Webster's, the ability to judge, make a decision, or form an opinion objectively or wisely. Good sense, again. Discernment. So, <clears throat> Judgment in the sense is exercised in all the time in business. Business executives often have to make decisions about whether to in, in invest in a new product line or to hire or promote an employee. <clears throat> it's used by movie critics uh, who have to form an aesthetic judgment about a film, as Roger Ebert uh, is famously doing here, the late Roger Ebert. <clears throat> Uh, and all of us in our personal lives make judgments all the time from the mundane, like whether it had dessert tonight, to uh, the more significant, more significant ones, like, you know, getting married. Now, what these and similar cases have in common, there's a wide range of considerations to take into account. For example, a business executive um, deciding about a new product line has to take account of he has to estimate the likely demand for the product, the cost of producing it, acquiring the facilities and the staff needed to produce it, um, what competing products there are from other uh, vendors, and you know, what and to what extent this new product would be unique in that, uh, in that marketplace, and so on and so forth. So the first element in judgment is uh, <clears throat> taking account that the, the context in which we need to exercise judgment is one in which, first of all, there are a number of relevant factors and we have to take account of them and integrate them somehow. So, for example, uh, for example um, even in um, marriage, you know, which despite the Hollywood um, uh, syndrome of you fall in love, you get married, you live happily ever after. If you're actually thinking about getting married, there are a lot of things to consider from, uh, you know, compatibility in, in how you live, how you keep the house, your finances, um, <clears throat> and on down the line to a zillion, uh, to a zillion factors as in this um, somewhat snarky cartoon. Uh, before you decide to marry someone, make them use a computer with a slow internet connection to see who they really are. Okay. <clears throat> um, secondly, we have to weigh the factors <clears throat> and in, in some way uh, as to which are essential or more essential than others. For example, despite my little cartoon joke there, uh, if everything else is, um, looks good, uh, uh, different degrees of patience on a slow internet connection shouldn't be a deal breaker. <clears throat> And then all, <clears throat> excuse me, all these things have to be integrated in order to reach a uh, conclusion or a decision. <clears throat> so judgment is a, in this wider sense, is a cognitive skill. And people have it in various degrees, and it can be improved and trained. <clears throat> so what I want to do today is talk, first of all, about the epistemology, epistemology of judgment. And you won't be surprised that uh, 
since I'm an epistemologist, that's going to take up the bulk of our time. <laughs> Um, but I also want to say a few words, at least, uh, about the psychology of judgment for re some very important reasons that we'll, we'll get to, and then some thoughts about um, how one improves <coughs> the quality of one's judgment. So <clears throat> let's go to um, the epistemology. The first point I want to make is that at its core, Judgment involves applying general principles to the specific case at hand, the particular person that we're thinking about or the specific uh, decision we have to make uh, or what, whatever it might be. It's applying an abstract principle um, to a situation. So, for, for example, in a moral judgment about a person's action, <clears throat> typically um, <clears throat> we have a principle to the effect that um, Actions of a certain type, P, are good or bad, the case may be. This action is a case of P. Um, might be telling a lie, uh, breaking a contract on the negative side, the bad side, or being productive on the positive side. Um, <clears throat> and therefore, this action was good or bad, depending. So for example, um, a high school boy uh, lied to his parents that he was not seeing a girlfriend when he actually was seeing her. Telling a lie is bad. Therefore, Jason did something bad. <clears throat> now, if this were all, there wouldn't be any real exercise of judgment involved. It's a straightforward deductive syllogism, uh, pretty open and shut case. But let's complicate the story a little bit. <clears throat> Suppose there's more to Jason's story. Suppose his girlfriend, Rashida, comes from a Muslim family of Lebanese origin. And the reason he feels he has to lie to his parents is that they disapprove of her, not because she or her family are jihadists or have any such sympathies, but simply because they're foreign and they're not Christian. An irrational prejudice. It's my story, so take it for granted this is the case. <clears throat> so in that case, another aspect of what Jason may be doing is trying to protect something that he values, uh, a relationship that has become important to him against the irrationality of his parents. <clears throat> so here's Jason and Rashida. We still have the syllogism that he lied and lying's bad, so he did something bad, but all, now we have the other factor, uh, acting to protect, the, uh, he was acting to protect the value against injustice and acting to protect our values is good. So he did something good. Well, obviously, we now have a situation that calls for judgment, because these are two contradictory conclusions, both backed by um, deductive syllogisms, um, but they can't both be right. <clears throat> so the deductive application <clears throat> of, <clears throat> uh, of general principles uh, is, is ne never in and of itself enough because we, it, in typical situations of judgment, the different factors point in different directions and so we have to do more if we're going to resolve the contradiction and uh, reach a, a, a sound conclusion or decision. That's where judgment comes in. <clears throat> How we do that, I'll get to in a moment. <clears throat> but first, let's take up another example. This one from business and I'm going to the example I have is from my own business, which is nonprofit management. <clears throat> uh, nonprofits get all or at least a very significant part of their revenues from contributions. Acquiring those contributions takes work, the exercise of fundraising skills, and therefore that work should be compensated. So one form of compensation is a commission, 10% of all the money you raise or whatever. Same as uh, salespeople. Same kind of system is widely used in sales. <clears throat> you know, whether it's an external um, contractor or even someone on staff. So we might put the argument for, uh, the argument this way. Raising funds creates value for the organization. Those who create value should be compensated proportionally. Commissions are a legitimate form of proportional compensation, assuming they've been set up fairly. Therefore, fundraisers may be paid commissions. <clears throat> However, 
commissions are generally frowned upon in the nonprofit world, at least the sector that we live in, <clears throat> because there are many reasons, actually. But one of them is that fundraisers can succeed in, in uh, uh, acquiring f contributions from donors only if the donors uh, like and, and want to support what the organization as a whole is doing, what results it has achieved in the past, and what results it th the donor thinks it has the potential to achieve. <clears throat> and those results are the product of the whole staff. So it, it's awkward at best uh, to think about one person getting a numerical commission when everyone else is on salary. So in this here, we might formulate the argument, oops, sorry, this way. Donors contribute uh, on the basis of the value the organization creates. That value is achieved by the staff as a whole. Those who create value should be compensated proportionally, a premise shared between the two arguments. Proportionate contributions should be determined by a common standard. Staff are compensated by salary. A commission is a different standard from salary. Therefore, fundraisers may not be paid commissions. <clears throat> Again, two deductive arguments with opposite contradictory conclusions. If there are any philosophers or logic mavens in the audience other than Lori Rice, <laughs> um, I know this is not in standard form as a deductive syllogism. I could put it in that form if I wanted to, but it would be ugly. <clears throat> so <clears throat> in order to <clears throat> resolve these contradictions, deduction alone will not do it. We have to turn to induction. And uh, for our purposes uh, on this issue, <clears throat> the, the significant differences between induction, deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning are twofold. One is that a deductive argument <clears throat> is either valid or invalid. There's no middle ground. The conclusion follows or it doesn't follow, period. For induction, however, <clears throat> inductive conclusions <clears throat> can be supported. Uh, there are a number of different forms of induction. There's generalization from a sample to a whole population, uh, which is not an issue here because we already have our generalization. Uh, argument by analogy is another form. Uh, probability judgments uh, involve inductive reasoning, <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> excuse me, and so forth. Uh, and those, the, the quality of those arguments are not measured by a yes or no criterion uh, of validity or invalidity. Deductive arguments uh, come with degrees of strength. <clears throat> Within, with induction, there's a, a continuum of weak, relatively weak to very strong support for a given conclusion. As we acquire more evidence, we become more, we have more and more grounds for considering that the conclusion uh, is true. <clears throat> the second difference is that uh, in deduction, the validity or invalidity of the argument is not affected by the rest of the context, the other factors that are um, maybe related somehow to the situation. If you have a general premise and a particular that falls under that premise, that's it. All the relevant context is packed into the premises, and so you, you don't have to look beyond it. That's one reason lots of people, uh, certainly in philosophy, people with mathematical inclinations, and frankly, a lot of objectivists I know, love deduction. <laughs> because it's clear, open and shut. Uh, <clears throat> you don't have to waffle uh, at all. On the other hand, induction is very affected by context. You can have a lot of evidence for a conclusion, say like imagine a uh, uh, prosecuting attorney <clears throat> who's built up a case uh, against the accused and the jury is thinking, well, that's pretty solid, that's pretty solid, yeah, it adds, all adds up. But then some new fact is introduced that they hadn't heard before, and all of a sudden, it changes the equation, okay? You can affect the strength by new information or uh, uh, remembering information that you had, but bringing it to bear for the first time. <clears throat> so to consider, let's um, go back to the case of Jason's lie. <clears throat> the, the argument that Jason did something bad rested on the premise 
that telling a lie is bad. Well, one thing we do <clears throat> in thinking through a situation like this is ask, okay, where did that premise come from? And is it, is it true and solid as stated? You can't just pull stuff out of the air. I mean, even a deductive argument is only, it, the conclusion is supported only to the extent that the premises are actually true, and the evidence for their truth typically relies at some point on induction. So telling a lie is bad? Well, the objectivist ethics says that dishonesty actually is not the act of telling a lie per se. It's trying to gain a value by deception, by faking reality in some way. And so in circumstances where you're not trying to gain a value but only to protect a value uh, in the face of a threat, <clears throat> We can't just go by the, by the straightforward, universal, Kantian-style claim, lying is bad. You should, should never do it. <clears throat> so we have, <clears throat> when we add that piece of information in, which comes from our inductive thinking about where the premise on the, the left-hand argument here, where that premise came from, uh, and you see the, the arrow with the uh, crosshatch meaning, uh, the, the deeper understanding of honesty and dishonesty uh, does uh, unsupports this premise. It weakens this premise. The argument's still valid, but the, the, uh, the solidity of that premise now is in question. And so that's one typical thing that you would do. Um, you think through what's the background of the premises. <clears throat> now, as we continue to think about this case, <clears throat> a host of other factors are going to arise. We've got this issue, was it, was Jason's lie, was it good or bad? Well, on the negative side, on the support of the claim that he was bad, sorry, um, he is living with his parents, they're supporting him, and, you know, there's, there's some rationale for the parental claim, my house, my rules. <clears throat> and then, his lie is almost certainly gonna be discovered. If he's going out, and they're, they're not meeting in some uh, hotel room in a far distant city. Uh, I, someone's gonna know, parents will find out, and he will lose their trust, not only on this particular issue, but they will, he will forfeit a large degree of their trust in him, which, which may have worse consequences even than not being able to see Rashida. On the positive side, his parents allowed him the freedom to date. <clears throat> It may well be that it was only because he had begun dating with his parents' uh, approval that he <clears throat> got to know Rashida well enough in the first place to learn, for each of them, to learn how much they care, <clears throat> they care about each other. Uh, so the irrational, uh, his parents, to that extent, have created the situation which they are then blocking with irrational uh, re restrictions. And then, if he were to comply with his parents' wishes, he's gonna to have to tell Rashida, which is like, I mean, he could lie to her, say, you know, I'm just, you know, I don't, it's not working for me. <laughs> but that's a lie, and so we, now we have a new situation of lying to deal with, so forget that. Uh, he's gonna tell her, and it, that's very likely to offend her, to offend her parents, um, and will expose his, his own parents publicly as bigots. So, he, to that extent, you can argue, well, you know, he's, he's not only protecting himself and his um, uh, relationship with R Rashida, but in a sense, even his own parents. And then finally, there's um, the consideration, were those the only two alternatives he had? Stop seeing her or see her but lie to his parents? <clears throat> this is a import really important question. Uh, whenever you have a situation where it seems like there, there's just alternatives and you're trying to decide which one is, is right, uh, there's a well-known logical fallacy called false dichotomy or um, false alternative when you, you too narrowly restrict what the alternatives are. So Jason had other alternatives. I mean, obviously, uh, in, in theory, he could have left home and then his parents' wishes wouldn't have mattered in that regard. At least he wouldn't have had to lie about it. Um, or more realistically, <clears throat> he could have talked to his parents and tried to persuade them. He could have said, look, their family came here to America because they wanted to be Americans. They have the same values we do. Uh, 
prejudice against them doesn't make any sense. Wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily work, but hey, that's usually worth a try. So what you have to do is put all of these into the same mix and reach some conclusion one way or the other, or some, if there's, maybe there's some middle ground between bad and good. Um, <clears throat> But the point is, it's going to take some inductive thinking to um, find the proper weight to give to each of these factors and then sum them up. Now, I want to just say two things about um, <clears throat> aspects of that mode of inductive thinking. <clears throat> One is that assigning the proper weight to them typically, if not always, means deciding which are essential, which things, which issues, which factors in the situation are essential. In uh, Ayn Rand's introduction to objectivist uh, epistemology, <clears throat> her theory on concepts, she said that concepts must be defined in terms of essential distinguishing properties. And uh, explained what makes something essential is it's fundamental. It underlies um, or explains the, uh, the other factors in the way that in defining human, we say rational animal because reason is a faculty that explains our other, many of our other distinguishing traits like the ability to speak, to tell jokes, to form contracts, to invent technology, and so on and so on. Well, the same basic concept of essentiality applies <clears throat> to uh, principles and to uh, the application of them to a situation in a case like Jason's, and I'm, I promise I will not keep beating this horse much longer, uh, y you need to decide which of the factors that I had uh, put up um, uh, and uh, any others that are relevant, which carry the essential weight. Now, in in aesthetic judgments, for example, <clears throat> such as the film that uh, a reviewer is uh, writing a review of, <clears throat> films have many, many aspects, acting, directing, cinematography, music, uh, of course, the script. <clears throat> and all of those have, are weighed by a good critic. But I would say that in this case, the essential issue is how fully the creators of the film realized a view of the world and how, how original it was and how well it was embodied in the elements of the art form. Uh, in a civil case at law where a judge is trying to decide um, a case in contract, say, where both parties have presented reasonable you know, precedents and arguments with some degree of, of, of rationality, um, the judge has to decide <clears throat> which precedent is he should go by, um, and that means which precedent is more fundamentally or essentially consistent with the whole body of precedents that are relevant to the case and with the underlying um, role of law in protecting individual rights. In moral judgment, uh, the essential factor is almost always the motive, the goal of the person uh, whose action you are judging. <clears throat> For those of you who were here Thursday, we talked about this a little bit in the uh, ethics uh, course that we uh, were teaching then. Uh, for example, as we saw in Jason's case, <clears throat> an essential issue in judging what he did is whether he was acting to gain a value by faking reality or acting to protect a value against a threat. Now, presumably there was no actual coercion here. So the threat is a threat of um, internal parental discipline uh, and uh, authority over the child, together with the irrationality of the restrictions they placed on it. So not a clear-cut case, I think. But that is, to me, an, an essential issue. Uh, another essential factor, I would say, is the fact that his parents did allow him to date. Um, and if they presumably made that that decision in, 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 uh, with his best interest at hand and you know, his growth and maturation, um, 
uh, fine, they created the situation that he finds himself in now, um, where they're, take, they're pulling the rug out from under him to an extent. Um, in business, <clears throat> the essential property is normally the, the company's purpose or mission. What are we aiming to achieve? And, of course, can we do so profitably? <clears throat> but in some contexts, the, the, the actual essential issue may be somewhat different. There's a, a book uh, that I read on integrity in business. Uh, by, it was called, just called Integrity by Henry Cloud. And one of, one of the stories he tells, or incidents he, he talks about, <clears throat> is a, um, a CEO who came to him for advice about what to do about a VP of sales because the, the VP of sales was hugely successful, a uh, great salesperson, was bringing in a ton of revenue. But he was so abrasive and obnoxious that he was alienating his colleagues uh, to the point where two other top executives threatened to leave. And so the CEO was perplexed because he felt caught in a trap because, gosh, I, you know, if I let the, this VP go, um, I'm really harming the company, that I could seriously harm the company's revenues, and that's my job, is to keep the companies going strong. But Cloud um, managed to convince him to look at the other costs, the loss of two other, potential loss, but high probability, of two other top well-performing executives, and the fact that this was taking, had already taken up so much of the CEO's time and would continue to do so as long as the VP of sales were around. And Cloud's main point was, look, re revenues, you, you can, you'll find another way to bring in revenues, but you can't ever regain the time that you're spending, and your time is one of the company's most essential assets. So that may or may not be a good um, judgment call. I'm, I'm not in that kind of business, so. Um, but I found it um, interesting and persuasive on the issue of the contextual nature of what's essential. <clears throat> okay, now I want to uh, <clears throat> turn uh, a little more briefly to uh, another issue. No, I'm sorry, I, this is the slide I was just uh, going over. Uh, I want to cover <clears throat> another aspect of, of the inductive process we go through. In many cases, because we're dealing with particulars, and we're applying abstractions to those particulars, we, we typically have to assess the degree to, to which the, the, the particular situation or person fits the abstraction. I mean, stealing is bad. That's a general principle. But stealing an apple from someone's tree is much less bad than stealing someone's retirement savings through some pyramid scheme, say. <clears throat> uh, so you have to, as I like to put it in the technical term, is reinsert the measurements that you omitted in forming the relevant concepts. <clears throat> and one of the, one of the, the things that um, is, I think, really important here is that we're, not talk we're rarely talking about um, cardinal measures, where you can assign cardinal numbers. Now, some of us um, were in Carol Ventresca's uh, workshop the other day, and she had some ingenious uh, ways of trying to you know, assign numbers so you could actually do some computation. And I'm all for that when it's possible. Uh, but typically, we're dealing, uh, in, especially in cases like moral judgment or personal situations, deciding to get married or whatever, um, it's often we're, we're, we're dealing with ordinal rankings. This, like the one I just gave, stealing an apple is less bad than um, stealing uh, someone's uh, retirement savings. I can't say it's 100 times or one, one hundredth as bad, I, but I can tell you, I, you give me a bunch of cases and I can, I can rank order them pretty well. We all can. And here's the point about induction. How do we rank order them? <clears throat> Typically, we have the case before us and to put it, in, to assess its degree, we have to think of other cases like it. We have to search our memory for other relevant cases and say, oh yeah, well, see, let me think of other lives that uh, I've had to 
you know, form passing judgment on. Uh, <clears throat> Or more broadly, cases of you know lying is a form of cheating in a way. So, what about all the cheating cases? Um, so we have we do a memory search, um, <clears throat> and that is an internal, typically an internal cognitive process, because um, none of us, uh, for many many of the cases, kinds of cases where we were making a judgment, none of us actually have um, uh, co such complete diaries of our lives. Uh, all coded and classified that we can, you know, look up lie and on these 17 pages, we, and so now we, I put these 17 things in, in order and, okay, this case at hand comes on, bumps uh, <clears throat> uh, number three down. <laughs> so, no, we not, that's not how we do it. We search memory. <clears throat> okay, so I, I want to move on because we, there, there is um, some more important, uh, some very important stuff to come. Um, the last point I want to make about, about the epistemology, per se, is that um, <clears throat> in all the, in all the uh, analysis I've been doing so far about the deductive element, the inductive elements, I've been laying out the reasoning in explicit, articulate, conscious terms, you know, coming out of my conscious mind, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> as if judgment were a capacity that is fully conscious and articulate. Well, it isn't. <clears throat> the integration of the relevant factors, and even sometimes uh, the calling up of relevant factors from memory, as in estimating degrees, uh, involves a, a lot of um, subconscious processing and integration. In somewhat like the same way that um, uh, I think on a good theory of emotion, which is the objectivist theory of emotion, we, uh, <clears throat> the emotion itself results from judgments and appraisals, interpretations, value judgments that are held in, implicitly, subconsciously, and um, are applied in an automatic subconscious way to the situation at hand. I would guess it's, a, you know, I, I would venture, I would not be at all surprised to find that the same brain circuits were involved. <clears throat> uh, and the most interesting case to me is the ones where you have information that came to you in a subconscious way, and it, you can, <clears throat> uh, the kind of hunch or nonverbal communication that we have in social situations sometimes. Um, I'm going to give you a simple everyday example. Um, <clears throat> I was in the uh, checkout line at the supermarket the other day. Uh, behind me was a mother with two children. Uh, and so I was unloading my cart, and then the older boy looked past me to the woman who was uh, paying the clerk and said, Hi, Miss Hollister. So I turned to look at her, and <clears throat> uh, she turned and said, Oh, hi, Tommy. So I turned back to the mother and said, A teacher? His teacher? She nodded and then went back to fussing with the younger child. Um, so I went back to unloading my cart. <laughs> and then Tommy says at, to me, how did you know she was my mother, uh, my, my teacher? I don't know, it was a guess. And a beat later he said, I know, it was because I said miss. You're right, good call. <laughs> um, I really was actually pretty impressed. He couldn't have been more than seven or eight. And already he's thinking about how minds work. You know, I'm, I think I, I think I just met the next great epistemologist in Western philosophy. <laughs> <clears throat> but thinking about it later, I think it wasn't just that he said miss. He might have said that. seemed like a well-brought-up boy. Uh, he might have said that to any adult woman um, other than an aunt or grandmother or whatever. Um, so what else was going on here? Maybe I noticed some surprise in his voice, the kind you feel when you see someone you know in one context in a context where you've never seen them and don't expect them. Uh, maybe, too, it was a, a bit of delight. Here was an authority figure doing the same mundane thing that he and his mom were doing. Um, and and I, I don't know, maybe it was the way the teacher responded. It was a little, just a little distant, you know, like if it was a friend of the family, I would have expected something a little more, you know, effusive or voluble. But if she spoke like someone, you know, who 
kept her distance a little bit. So, <clears throat> but here's the thing. I was almost certain that I was right that this was his, the kid's teacher before the mother confirmed it. But why, why I, what, what were my reasons? You know, running through some of the things I might have noticed, um, there I really am guessing. <laughs> uh, and, <clears throat> you know, may, maybe if I went into some kind of deep hypnosis or therapy and uh, to relive the situation with a skilled uh, psychiatrist, I could <clears throat> pull it out, but I, even then it would be dubious. <clears throat> So, of course, that's a, um, an example of a quick judgment based on whatever, body language, nonverbal things you pick up in whatever way we pick those up. Uh, but even in cases where, where we're, we are making <clears throat> le less concrete decisions or concrete or decisions that involve uh, more thinking, more broader issues, like a reviewing a movie or moral judgment or a business decision. <clears throat> there, there are too many factors, almost always too many factors to hold in your conscious mind at one time. I mean, it's a fact, uh, it's a central part of objective epistemology, but it's widely known in psychology. Attention is a very limited resource. You, you, you spend it one place and you're not, you're not on the other stuff. But all of it has to go in. So but there's a lot of, has to be inevitably a lot of subconscious processing. Um, and on top, in, in addition, the con what the conscious mind has to be doing in these cases is not only attending to one thing, then another thing, and another thing, and weighing it each one in turn, but it's also the, um, the captain of the ship uh, putting questions to your subconscious mind, to your memory. Uh, looking for um, uh, what information, asking yourself what information do I need and do I have it, and so forth. So in that sense, uh, the conscious mind is like the, uh, the chair of a committee meeting, it's just keeping the meeting on track, while the subconscious um, is in effect the secretary, taking notes and looking up files and stuff. Uh, but it all has to come together. And that leads me to the next uh, broad topic, <clears throat> which is, the psychological issues, because with so much subconscious work going on, um, there are, um, we are vulnerable to um, subconscious quirks, precisely because we're not necessarily, we're not conscious of them, so we're not in full cognitive volitional control. Um, <clears throat> so one of the interesting things, uh, I, I think some of you have uh, seen this book by uh, Daniel Kahneman, Thinking fast and slow. Kahneman is a uh, <clears throat> both a psychologist and economist, uh, and economist. He won the Nobel Prize with um, with Vernon Smith. Smith. Yes, thank you. With Vernon Smith uh, for advances in behavioral economics. Um, if you saw Stephen Hicks's talk yesterday, a lot of the work that uh, Daniel Kahneman did and um, uh, the psychological work he did with a colleague Amos Tversky. Um, who passed away a while back. Uh, a lot of that work is the basis for that book, Nudge, which is being used as one of the arguments for a, government, a degree of government paternalism. In any case, um, Kahneman's uh, new book is interesting. Um, it's built around a distinction he draws between, he just calls them system one and system two. <clears throat> System one is involved in things like what I was going on in my mind in the grocery store. It operates automatically and quickly. It doesn't, there's little or no experienced effort, no sense of voluntary control. It's like, you know, I ask you, what's two plus two? And four jumps into your mind without effort and without control. Um, System two is, so his system one is essentially what I would call the subconscious, although they're not quite identical. And system two allocates attention to the effortful mental activities that demand it. The operations of system two are often associated with subjective experience of agency, choice, and concentration. 
So there we have the conscious mind. And what's interesting about his book, where he um, talks a lot about the research that he and other people have done. He was one of the founders of this field in psychology. Um, it's actually called the uh, Heuristics and Biases uh, Study in Cognitive Psychology, because it's a study of the implicit heuristics that we use subconsciously. Um, we, like, uh, one typical example, I'm not going to do anything with this, but um, we make probability judgments all the time. <clears throat> but we, <clears throat> we make a lot of probability judgments just on in a kind of intuitive sense or a, a, a judgment call. Yeah, I'd say there's about 50-50 about chance of this. It's not because we have done <clears throat> vast, meter, uh, uh, vast studies of, and records of how often a given outcome happens in situations exactly like this, like the meteorologists do in, in saying 60% chance of rain today. Uh, and so we, we use simplifying heuristics of various kinds, and those often are as accurate and, and wonderful as they often are, they do um, make us vulnerable to certain biases. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go into the whole biases. I've, um, I've I spent uh, one lecture in a course a couple years ago at the summer seminar on, on uh, the various biases. I'm, but I'm just going to talk about one that I consider the, the master bias, the confirmation bias. It's the tendency to look for and give excessive weight to evidence that supports a conclusion while ignoring, downplaying, or failing to seek evidence against it. This is an old, old insight. It goes back at least to Francis Bacon uh, in the uh, 17th century. And I love, I love Bacon's prose, so I'm actually going to read this, even though you can see it on the screen. The human understanding, when it has once adopted an opinion, draws all things else to support and agree with it. And though there be a greater number and weight of instances to be found on the other side, yet these it either neglects or despises, or else by some distinction sets aside and rejects, in order that, by this great and per pernicious predetermination, the authority of its former conclusions may re remain inviolate. There, in one compact, typical Lord Bacon <laughs> uh, paragraph, actually sentence, uh, two sentences, uh, you have almost the complete analysis of the different, not only of what confirmation bias is, but of its many forms. <laughs> so, all right. The um, <clears throat> confirmation bias applies across almost every realm of cognition. Um, but it certainly applies in judgment, because once we start leaning toward a conclusion, the bias, uh, I, and just, I'm not going to give you all the information, all, all the uh, experimental studies, but I think it, Probably in, uh, in introspection will get us a certain distance here. Um, you start looking for, okay, I want to, am I right? Am I right? Okay, I'm looking for evidence to confirm that I'm right. Okay, did I buy the right car? Okay, I, hey, I just noticed another great thing about this car. <laughs> uh, instead of, before you make the decision and buy the car, uh, in, instead of asking uh, or looking for contrary evidence. And because so much of the processing that goes on in making a judgment is subconscious, it's, if anything, most important in that realm to be able to do that. Um, and which brings me really to the last section, improving judgment. Again, uh, this, would, this would be worth an entire talk, and um, <clears throat> which I would love to do sometime. But let me just give a, a, a couple of points. <clears throat> First thing, very easy to do. What if I'm wrong? Could I be wrong? Is there anything that I should look for that would prove me wrong? I mean, this is a deep part of scientific methodology, but the same fundamental epistemological principle applies to uh, our everyday thinking and professional thinking as well. And actually, there is experimental evidence that um, where people are in a situation that elicits confirmation bias, but a, uh, an experimental group um, is given the instruction, weigh the pros and cons 
and the control group isn't, actually the experimental group tends to do better. I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, another example, raise the stakes. Okay. When you're making a decision, there already are some stakes. Um, uh, there's some good to be had from uh, making the right decision, some harm to be done, or loss, or lack of gain to have if the decision is wrong. But you, even there, you can um, increase the stakes by, um, you know, there are various little games you play. One of my favorites, and I'll just tell the story quickly. Um, I know a couple who are both economists, um, and the, the uh, husband, when they're driving together, the husband is, is uh, pretty confident about um, there'll be gas stations ahead. So, but when the needle gets to a quarter tank, his wife, who's a little more cautious, is saying, let's stop here. There's a gas station. Let's stop and fill a tank. And the husband says, I don't want to fill it um, until we can fill the whole thing. Um, and it goes back and forth. But they work out a system. And being economists, it was an economic system. Um, the husband would say, OK, I'll post a bond that you will get if we run out of gas before the next gas station. Uh, how, how big does that bond have to be? <laughs> 100 bucks, 500, 1,000. And you know, you put it that way, and she said, well, 1,000, you know, I could, do, I could walk to the next gas station for 1,000 bucks. <laughs> anyway, simple way to raise the stakes. Learn from others. Uh, I said at the beginning that judgment is a skill that people have in different degrees. And one of the things you can do when you're, when you're working with people or making a decision among friends or spouses. Listen to what people are contributing to the, to the, um, to the mix. And if someone is, you, if you notice that someone is getting to an essential point time and time again, um, well, stop and say, OK, what's he doing? What, what can I learn from this? I, I've, I've been doing this, um, and, and I'm I continue to do it because I'm, I really respect people who can, who can zero in and cut through the surface stuff to the, to the basis. <clears throat> and finally, learn from yourself. One of the many pieces of wisdom from Will Rogers, good judgment comes from experience, and a lot of that comes from bad judgment. <laughs> so learn, learn, watch other people who are engaged in good judgment and think about why the bad judgments you made were bad, and how not to do it. So thank you. Um, uh, let's take any questions you have for about 10 minutes. You emphasized uh, looking for the essential, mm -hmm. which is that which explains many of the other factors. But aren't judgment calls often brought about precisely because the reasons to do A and the reasons to do B are very different, and what you're facing is not so much one essential thing to find but rather a weighing of the costs and benefits of A versus the costs and benefits of B, where there may not be any standard short of going back to something very fundamental, such as you know, life, yeah. um, in terms of which they are commensurable. And so first of all, in cases where the question is, what should I do? Um, is there really all that likely to be that one essential question, other than something at that level of abstraction, uh, rather than a matter of weighing very different pros and cons? And in the matter of evaluating others, <clears throat> Isn't it often better to say, well, I don't actually need to know whether his decision was right, all things considered. What's much more relevant is 
you know, what's much more relevant to my needs in terms of figuring out how to interact with him going forward uh, is to know he will tend to prefer this value and this, you know, this value and this way of acting over that one uh, in cases where they seem to come into conflict. Okay. Well, I, I think I'm hearing two different issues or, or questions. Um, let me Somewhat related, though. <laughs> yeah. Everything's related, Alexander. You know that. <laughs> well, sure. We could take it all back to that highest level of abstraction. Um, uh, in the, in the, in the situation you described abstractly, um, where uh, there are uh, two alternatives, but different factors um, uh, apply in each case, and there's no one essential factor ex except at some very high level of abstraction. I think those, I, I don't. I wouldn't say that's impossible, but I think those are fairly rare because what makes them alternatives is uh, something that relates them. You know, um, invest in this new product line or don't. You know, put the money elsewhere, uh, marry this person or not. Uh, and now the. the there, there are areas such as um, managing your own time, which, uh, apart from the details of how you keep track of meetings and phone calls and so forth, involves, um, on a 24-hour basis, involves um, what, how much time am I going to devote to this, that, or the other activity? And activities are not necessarily commensurable, um, except at a high level of that they both will consume time and they all provide some value to me. Um, but then there, you just, when you, I think if we took particular cases and worked them through, we'd, we'd find more and more um, uh, links that we could um, evaluate in terms of essentiality. Now, I also, but I do want to say, this, this, there's not necessarily going to be one essential factor uh, in, in in the theory of concepts, the definitions don't always have just one essential uh, distinguishing feature. It sometimes takes a couple. The point is the, the one or several that underlie a, a number of others. So uh, looking for the essential issues is really a, a winnowing factor. Let's, I want to get the, to the essence of this. So um, that mode of thinking is, OK, this is, this is relevant. It's part of the situation. but it, it just, I'm not, not going to put a lot of weight on it. This one gets more weight, in my thinking. <clears throat> um, second part of your question, I, I think was, or the second question was, um, in the case of moral judgment, where I'm judging a person, yeah, often I, that is what I want to know. I, I, I'm, I'm, my interest in, often in assessing an action is, <clears throat> um, what does that imply about what I can expect from this person in the future? That is, the action, uh, a specific action on a particular occasion is evidence for an assessment of character going forward. And that's typically, that is, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that is 99% um, of why moral judgment um, uh, is important. <clears throat> so, but I, if I didn't say this, I'm sorry, I should have. Um, typically, in the case of judging a person, the, the, uh, you look primarily, almost always, one essential feature is what was their motive? What was their, what was their, their reason for doing what they did? Um, uh, because presumably, the motive and the reason are not just one-time things. They come from something uh, in character or personality. Um, it was something else I wanted to say. If it comes back, it will. Okay, but uh, so let me take Ralph. Good. I actually want to play off of Alexander's first point. Okay. Take, take an example of someone who is committed to his career. It's advancing. Um, he falls in love. For some geographic reason, he has to make a choice, let's say not between career, but between particular job and his lover. Uh -huh. um, I think of this as a case where you have hierarchy of values, but you have two hierarchies of values. And let's say he hasn't previously had to integrate the two. Yes. Now he does. Right. And that's the key issue. And I think it can be many people's experience that they can make lists of pros and cons for, for each. 
and it doesn't help all that much. <laughs> the place where it might most help is what are some alternatives? I can move, you know, I can uh, yeah. be a long distance commuter and so forth. Right. But apart from that, I think it often comes down to gut response. To what? To a gut response. These are both real important to me. What, which yeah. will I feel you know, better or least miserable doing? And that may be a case where the subjective or the emotional side, it, it's very, where it's very hard to consciously and rationally come to a solution until this integration of the two hierarchies occurs. Yeah. Which may take a while. No, I, that's a great example. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I think you described it very, very accurately in epistemological terms. You have two hierarchies that you didn't have to integrate before. Now you do. And how are you going to do that? Uh, so there, uh, there is a, a, a lot of discussion in uh, academic philosophical ethics about whether the different values we pursue are commensurable at all. And um, many philosophers say no. Um, it's just there's no overarching single goal like Aristotle's um, eudaimonia or for objectivism, you know, life and happiness. <clears throat> and sometimes it certainly feels that way. <laughs> um, and in cases like that, I mean, my experience is it takes a while. I, I just, I, I mull. <laughs> um, people I work with know, you know, I'm probably tired of hearing myself, okay, I, I need to mull about that. But really, I mean, it, it's, my subconscious sometimes feels like a crock pot, and I, I throw the <laughs> stuff in and hope that, you know, a couple of days later I get something tasty. <laughs> <clears throat> um, some kind of integration is definitely going on. Mm -hmm. And the, when, when, you, when you get the tasty conclusion, <laughs> um, it often comes with, with a, what feels like a feeling, you experience as a feeling. Right. Okay, this is, this is right. This is right. I think it's the feeling of certainty and, and relief about uncertainty, uh, about escaping uncertainty. I'm very I'm leery, though, about treating this as an, an emotion per se, or that the emotion is the decision, because I, I think whatever feelings may be there, the actual integration is basically cognitive. Um, the emotion is like a signal, you know, done. <laughs> uh, I'm actually, in response to what you're saying, I'm okay. thinking, Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's, yeah we've there's run there's out line. of uh, time. Oh, we're out of time. Can so. I take Carol? I just. Oh. Well, I initially stood up. I initially stood up after Alexander's point, um, and then I sat down again because, first of all, <laughs> I want to say what a wonderful talk it was and how how I really enjoyed it and wished Thank I had you. heard it before I prepared mine. <laughs> but. Um, uh, so, so I, I judge that you are perfectly competent to address the points, and I should sit down. But now, <laughs> since, you, <laughs> since, you've, since you've recognized me, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Uh, Alexander was struggling over A or B. Was that a false dichotomy? Is it A or B or neither mm -hmm. or C? Uh, and one would infer, if you have to choose A or B, that they are mutually exclusive. But if you would choose A for reason one and B for reason two, then apparently this decision is going to try to achieve multiple criteria for you, right. multiple values. And so you need to think about what all of those are before you do A, B, C, or neither. And your issue of having essential factors and thinking about those things, the essential factor to helping you achieve value one, that and the essential factors to achieving value too, maybe that'll help you think about an alternative F that is kind of a better combination of those things. Uh, yeah. and, and that's part of the rational process of going through this. And I guess I didn't say yesterday that the output of the process I espouse is indeed a cardinal ranking of things based on desirability. And, and so right. anyway, I, I love having the choir preach to me or preaching to the <laughs> choir. Thank you. Great. OK, thanks, everybody. Uh, let's go to lunch. <laughs>